to thank uh, uh, Dr. Saurabh uh, for uh, uh, inviting me for this uh, particular uh, session uh, hosted by the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, uh, Nagpur City Branch. And I also thank uh, Dr. Milin, Dr. Balaji, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Cham, who is a very close friend of mine. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes. So now, uh, is it okay if you can uh, mute yourself and can be off the videos so that uh, what happens, we can maintain the brand width and there won't be any uh, disturbances. So Rob, in case if I go off the audio or video, please let me know. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So uh, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Shubhada Deshmukh, uh, she has already uh, given you a short history of how regional anesthesia works. And we are going to uh, deal about the nerve blocks uh, distal to the brachial plexus. But I think you cannot really leave the brachial plexus because the, the, uh, the problem is it really starts from there. And then it becomes difficult as you go still more low down. Then you get some inadequacies, some deficiencies, and they have to be then supplemented. And really, then we have to go again really proximal. So let's try to uh, have a uh, look at this. Now, so uh, this is our hospital where I work, and now the other side is demolished. We are building a new one, and they are, these are both the stalwarts of our uh, institute, Sanchiti Institute. Dr. K. H. Uh, Sanchiti and Dr. Parak Sanchiti, who has given, who have given me a real good platform for uh, academic, my academic interests uh, all these years. Now, I've been working in a lot of uh, capacities, as uh, mentioned by Madam. I have expanded that to several extent, and I really work a lot on uh, you know, considering the original uh, techniques, the cadavers, as well as the uh, uh, clinical studies. The course will be on innervation of shoulder, which is very important for us. The old trends and the recent trends that we have to uh, uh, we have to follow. Basically, you need to know about the innervation of the shoulder joint, and this was uh, studied uh, systematically in uh, 1857 by Rudinger. And then uh, 40 calibers were dissected, which in that article they mentioned that the axillary, suprascapular, and the anterior thoracic nerve are the ones which are. Uh, innervating the joint. The anterior thoracic nerve is the lateral pectoral nerve. Just keep it in mind. Now, if you see this uh, by Ernest Gardner, uh, now these are the fetal samples which were dissected and they found that the anterior part of the shoulder is all supplied by the axillary, while the, the, the posterior part is all supplied by the suprascapular nerve, except in one sample, uh, which they found was that the um, now there was multiple innervation on the anterior side from the lateral pectoral, posterior cord, radial, and axillary. So such kind of uh, variations we will be uh, seeing it all the time. It was read one year later in 1949, who mentioned that the subscapularis uh, uh, innervates the joint as well as the musculocutaneous nerve. And then he also mentioned the upper and lower uh, subscapular um, uh, nerves which anastomose with the axillary now to form a complete uh, uh, anastomotic innervation of the uh, shoulder joint. Uh, this is a very important reference if you, uh, those who want to really learn the uh, shoulder innervation and the possible anatomical landmarks, uh, this is a very important reference. Now they mentioned that this is the superior of the joints, the, uh, this uh, portion of the joint which is supplied by the lateral pectoral nerve. And this is the uh, the posterior and the superior part which is supplied by the suprascapular nerve. Now see that they arise from C5. Both these uh, nerves, they arise from the C5 and the C6 and the lateral cord, and then they innervate. So basically, if you give uh, local anesthesia in this portion at this point of time, I would say that uh, this really uh, should help in uh, blocking the shoulder joint. But it's not, that's not very easy because uh, you have the uh, you have the uh, the other nerves, and these nerves are the um, uh, these nerves are the axillary nerve, which supplies the anterior part, and then the suprascapular nerve, which anastomoses with the axillary in the inferior portion of the joint. And the axillary nerve is one which comes from the uh, posterior cord, and the radial uh, nerve is the one which terminates as the posterior cord. Now you know that we we know that the fascicles of the suprascapular nerve, the axillary nerve, the posterior anterior divisions, and the musculocutaneous nerve. If you trace these retrograde, they all end up at the level of C5. So basically, when you inject at the point of C5, you might produce a good shoulder analysis. That is what is uh, my hypothesis. And this is what we have presented for clavicle surgery, which is now accepted in anesthesia analysis. And this might come the, at the end of this year. 
So if you take a cross section, now uh, these people from Ames, they took a cross section at the level of C5 and C6, and they found that they, it contains the particles of axillary nerve, the posterior cord, the lateral cord, the muscular cutaneous, and the suprascapular nerve. And it's very important uh, to have to find that the C6 contains on the uh, every every everything and also the lateral pectoral nerve. So it really means that if you inject a local anesthetic at these two points, it really helps in uh, you know having a good uh, uh, a good uh, shoulder analgesia. So concluding the shoulder innervation is the one where the motor and sensory are supplied by the uh, suprascapular and the axillary nerve, and the sensory by the lateral pectoral muscular cutaneous subscapular nerve. And the cutaneous is of, by the suprascapular nerve, which comes from C34, the superolateral cutaneous nerve of arm from the axillary nerve, the muscular cutaneous nerve of arm from the muscular uh, uh, cutaneous nerve, and the lateral cutaneous nerve of arm from the intercostal brachial nerve. So there are hosts of nerves. If you go still more uh, distally, there are hosts of nerves which need to be blocked, and they need to be blocked adequately. Otherwise, it might be, be become uh, an uh, in, uh, efficient block. So in theory, what uh, I would propose at this point of time is a C5 root block, a C5 and C6 block, and just above the exit of the suprascapular nerve. So these are the, these are the ones that I would propose for the uh, shoulder analgesia. But the surgical anesthesia is the one which we uh, usually have the interscalian superior trunk block, supraclavicular block, and the uh, cervical epidural that we are going to uh, deal with. The gold standard is the interscalian block, uh, which is given particularly at this point. Uh, between the um, uh, between the anterior scalene and the middle scalene muscle uh, at this point, anywhere at this point. So if you palpate the interscalene group and you inject around 20 ml of local anesthetic, it will give you good block, but it, it is a grade one evidence that it can produce phrenic nerve paresis because the phrenic nerve lies on the anterior scalene muscle. It is entirely covered by the uh, fascia of the investing layer. And if you give the brachial plexus block interscalene at this point, it is going to block the phrenic nerve as well as it is going to go cephalad and produce an epidural spread. Now, this is again a small uh, clip. Uh, you might have seen it uh, uh, a couple of times. Uh, this is the uh, insertion of the needle at the interscalene groove after palpating just between these two fingers. So you feel a small pop. Once you feel a pop of the investing layer of uh, deep cervical fascia, you start getting uh, the deltoid contractions at 0.4 milliamperes. That is the end point. You inject around 25 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine with 30 mics of clonidine, and it might be associated with the uh, superficial cervical plexus block. And this will help in blockade of the uh, the entire shoulder joint, where you can perform open and close surgeries of the uh, of, for the shoulder. Now, this is long back. If you see, this is in 1991 that uh, William Urme performed ultrasonography of the diaphragm, and he injected 34 to 52 ml with 1.5% uh, mepivacaine with neurostimulator and found 100% incidence, which regressed in three to four hours. Now, what they did was after this study, when they found that there was 100% incidence of diaphragmatic paralysis, they decreased the volume to 10 ml, and they still found that 80% of the times there was hemidiaphragmatic paralysis. All these are articles in 1990s. So, when you when I found that when you inject contrast at this level with the neurostimulation, there was epidural spread, a cephalad spread, which I'm more interested in that. It goes right, it lateralizes the epidural, and it comes out from the C3 and the C4 and at the level of C5. This is the level of C6 and have injected at the level of C7. So it's possible that with 10 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine, we are still producing what I call as a lateral cervical epidural, possibly, not in all the patients. So how can we avoid this? By decreasing the volume and concentration, they did it in with neurostimulation. But by precisely placing the tip and positioning it with ultrasound or using an alternative technique, this is quite possible. So we do ultrasound nowadays, and what we do is that you see that these are the uh, th uh, this is the brachial plexus and these are the the hypoechoic ones are the trunks or the roots this is c5 this is c you know, c6 and this is the c7 c8 and t1 you don't require this you may not require this but if you position your needle here which i call it as a safe zone the needle comes either through the middle skeletal muscle or out of plane and you deposit a local anesthetic lateral to the uh, um, uh, brachial plexus so as to avoid the phrenic nerve. This is coming from the C4, and this is contribution from C5. If you inject at this point, you can get uh, a good um, uh, brachial plexus block at the interscalene area for uh, shoulder surgery. So they had a surgical anesthesia, how, how low we can go. They did it with even uh, uh, with a 5 ml per trunk, or a final volume of 1.7 ml per trunk. 
This was a very good uh, analysis by step up, step down method by Philip Gauthier, one of my friends from uh, <clears throat> from Europe. And he produced a surgical anesthesia of 5 ml. But I'm quite surprised they could do a total shoulder replacement, which requires a lot of relaxation. I can accept arthroscopy surgeries, but it's doubtful the total shoulder replacement and the humoral fractures. So another study which mentions 0.5% bupovacan with a starting volume of 7.5 ml, all under ultrasound, which was placed between the upper and middle trunk. And the final volume, what they state was, you can use 1.34 ml for the um, uh, for the upper trunk, for the middle trunk it's 1.64 and for the lower trunk 2 ml. What was found was in this study was that there was no hemidephrodematic paralysis if the volumes were less than 4.3 ml. And for six hours, there was no pain without any analgesics uh, with a volume of around uh, 2.34 ml. And that's what really uh, creditable. Uh, we recently conducted uh, a study which is now being published in GOACP where uh, I used 5 ml of uh, local anesthetic 0.5% bucovacan uh, for shoulder analgesia, arthroscopic surgeries under general anesthesia. And the average duration of analgesia was around 10.5 uh, hours. And with the very least uh, requirement of uh, opiates in the form of tramadol. So, some of the modified blocks for the shoulder surgery was giving at the level of C7, but I so, uh, suspect uh, intraplex is spread with this and possible vertebral artery injections if you don't see the tip of the needle. And they also injected around 15 ml at C5. That's quite a huge amount of drug because that's where the phrenic nerve lies. We saw that at this point. And if you inject that, it definitely produces a phrenic nerve block. I really suspect how the reviewers could not find any problem in this particular article. Now, the dilemma of C7 intraplexus, what they did at C7, I gave just one ml and ultrasound, and you can see one ml of contrast going right into the epidural spread. So the chances of two things, one is the phrenic nerve paralysis, and second of epidural spread are quite high when you use an intraskeletal block with large volume of local anesthetic. So what about the supraclavicular block with ultrasound? You know that this is the omohoid, that is the brachial plexus, the entire brachial plexus. These are the lateral divisions of the brachial uh, plexus. We call it uh, the SPA, S-P-A, is the suprascapular nerve and the anterior and posterior divisions. And this is the one which, if, if blood gives you a good shoulder analysis, and we are currently studying on this. And this is the first strip on which lies the uh, artery and the uh, brachial plexus. You will see that when you start um, uh, scanning uh, from the uh, from the cephala to quarter, you can find the interscalene inter trunks and they go on to find the roots. Uh, as you go above and as you come down, you will find that they form the superior trunk, the middle trunk, and the inferior trunk. I use the bent needle technique to approach to the posterior uh, or to the corner pocket. So this is the corner pocket, which is formed by the rib and the uh, and the artery here. So if you inject small volumes of local anesthetic here, you get a supraclavicular block. But it's the if you want a shoulder analysis, you should be injecting at this point. So this is the point of injection for all your shoulder analysis, and we are studying on that. We call it as the infra omohoid block. So what is the superior trunk block? Now, if you see this uh, dissection I conducted with Shiv Prakash in JSS Mysore, this is the C5, C6 trunk for forming the uh, the roots forming the superior trunk, and then they form the superior trunk and gives the suprascapular nerve, and these are the, the divisions. This is the nerve to subclavicular, which goes to the clavicle. This is the C7, C8, and that's the uh, subclavian artery. The phrenic nerve, you can see, it lies very close to the C5 and the uh, upper part of the superior trunk, but lower down, it's quite far away. So the uh, chances of phrenic nerve are less. So if you go, keep on going more uh, distal or more corded, the incidence of the uh, phrenic nerve and the uh, epidural spread uh, would be less. And this has been mentioned in this particular article by Vincent Chan. And you can see that the probe placement is here and the, 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 and the, the drug placement be, will be here and the phrenic nerve will be quite far away. Now, you would ask me whether the supraclavicular block that you give, it does the same thing. Of course, it might be doing the same thing. You may do it with the paresthesia technique in the remote or rural areas where you do not have <coughs> access to the uh, ultrasound or the penis, or you do with the neurostimulation and you inject at this point. But make it a point to inject more lateral, to have a shoulder analysis here. So that is my point of uh, this, particular, uh, 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 this particular technique here. Now, what they mentioned with the superior trunk block, which was used by these authors, and it was a randomized controlled trial against the interscalene block, and they found that the, when used in uh, almost 126, 126 patients, they found that the incidence of uh, the uh, incidence of uh, phrenic nerve paralysis was more with the uh, 
the ultrasound guided interscaling block rather than the superior trunk block. So that was, was the conclusion and the analgesic effect was almost same, but a slight lesser, uh, uh, was, uh, slight more was scores with the superior trunk, trunk block. Now, they also mentioned that the interscaling block has more hemidiaphragmatic paralysis and more incidence of adverse effects. But if you see the patient satisfaction in PACQ and on day one and day two, they're almost the same. But the time to discharge was more early with the superior trunk block rather than with interstellar block. So probably the because of the diaphragmatic paralysis, they stayed for a long time uh, than the uh, patient with superior trunk block. So we are conducting a dose uh, finding study where we use uh, the volumes of uh, 5 and 10 ml for the infrahomoid suprascapular nerve block and infraclavicular block and 3 ml and 7, 7 ml for the same blocks. And the intermediate findings are that the volumes which we use, 5 and 10, they're adequate, but the uh, sometimes we get uh, a blockage of the entire um, uh, limb as well as uh, in two patients of uh, 10, we found that there was hemidiaphragmatic paralysis. So it's uh, still an incomplete study. These are the intermediate findings. So in opinion, um, uh, in my opinion, if for avic shoulders, which we do quite commonly here, we use interscaling block. With PNS, if you want to use, you use 25 to 50 ml and you have to give at this point with the possible uh, phrenic nerve paralysis. With ultrasound, we can still go low down because we can now see the structures at the level of C5, C6, and we just give around 12 to 15 ml of local anesthetic. With ultrasound, important thing to be kept in mind is needle goes to the middle skeletal muscle, the dorsal scapular nerve can be traumatized. And this can lead to a problems of the uh, shoulder joint in the post operative period. You need to know that. You can still go low down for shoulder analysis. I can use uh, volumes not more than 5 ml. And uh, you, you can also uh, use the infra omoid suprascapular nerve block. Uh, these are called as the discrete nerve blocks. And they can be used with uh, low volumes of local anesthetic. Suprasclavicular brachial plexus, you can use maybe around uh, 20 to 25 ml with the neurostimulation. But with ultrasound, I use not more than uh, 15 ml. And the least I have used was 8 ml uh, of local anesthetic for a patient of 90 years age. Now, really going away from the brachial plexus, but which is a component of the uh, brachial plexus, the cervical uh, epidural uh, analysis. And, and this I have used in some of the patients for the, uh, some of the, patients for the uh, proximal uh, humerus. Uh, this is the patient in uh, sitting position. I identify with the routine loss of resistance technique. And this is the, uh, once that is done, then I uh, just rotate the uh, epidural needle in place. Uh, there are some arguments against rotating the epidural needle in the epidural space. Then I insert the uh, stimulating catheter. And once I attach the stimulating catheter to the peripheral uh, nerve stimulator, you now uh, see the contractions of the uh, back muscles. And as I go higher up, you'll see the contractions of the triceps and the biceps and then the deltoid. At this point, when you have the uh, contractions of the deltoid on the side of the surgical procedure, is the end point. Then you, uh, uh, I mean, uh, tape the catheter to the back and then just identify, you can see that there is a unilateral contractions of the, uh, of the limb that is the uh, uh, catheter in the cervical epidural space, which is stimulating the spinal cord and there's no contractions on the other side. I just have looked at the uh, uh, length of spread of the drug or the placement of the catheters. Uh, in the uh, dorsal area. Uh, this is the AP view, that's the lateral view. It's exactly in the dorsal area, which is where it's required. And uh, just 5 ml of local anesthetic was enough uh, in the cervical epidural space to have the proximal uh, humerus surgery done in this, uh, in, this, in this procedure. But the problem here is the uh, surgeons, they really do not much appreciate the cervical epidural uh, anesthesia against the brachial plexus. But anyway, we, uh, we could do uh, a couple of cases and uh, they had a good relaxation, uh, adequate analgesia, and in the post-operative period, um, they were uh, infused with 0.1% uh, ropivacan at around uh, 4 ml per hour. That was more than enough for analgesia of 24 hours to uh, 48 hours. So uh, this is one uh, block that you can use as a, for uh, anesthesia as well as analgesia. Uh, for the uh, surgical procedures on the proximal humors. We, uh, I also did a bilateral um, proximal humor surgery under cervical uh, epidural, epidural as well. So now coming to the next part, what is basically the talk is the suprascapular uh, nerve block, the axillary nerve block, the cervical erector spinal plane block, and the costoclavicular block. So these are discrete nerve blocks, and we know why we, sh we should be giving this is to avoid uh, peripheral uh, nerve paralysis, that is the PNP, epidural spread, as we have already discussed, and 
there are two studies which mention about the uh, post-operative neurological complications with the interscreen block, which was observed either immediate or delayed. And this is by Alan Bourget, which was observed with the neurostimulation. And there, were, there is another article by Fredrickson from Australia. And he mentions that a couple of uh, patients, um, they receive after ultrasound guided block uh, developed uh, post-operative neurological complications. Uh, but the basic uh, importance we, we, we always give is to analyze uh, efficacy. Now, let me be very, very clear here. In last 25 years that I have been using a peripheral nerve stimulator, I have not come across a major epidural spread causing a complication, like a total spinal, for example. I need to intubate the patients. I've never seen that. Or, in, in fact, uh, phrenic nerve paralysis. I've seen that in, uh, in two patients who had severe chronic obstructive airway disease. And yes, I had to abandon and had to intubate and ventilate the patient. And then I had to make, prepare the patient for the next uh, next time and then again give an uh, interscreen block. So there are only a few patients that I remember till today uh, that uh, have been complicated. But nevertheless, we, disc disc we discuss this as we go ahead, as we start seeing the structures more, more clear. So the modalities are landmark guided neurostimulation and ultrasound. Now, this is a pain clinic in Gondole Charitable Trust that I've been visiting for the last 25 years. And here, here I have a data from uh, 2000 to 2020, almost 20 years, where uh, we do a lot of shoulder, hip, knee, and spine, uh, and, uh, and they, they come for uh, all these uh, uh, block procedures and uh, daycare. So they, these are suprascapular nerve block and axillary nerve block. And I get a lot of exposure, particularly the landmark guided. Now, once the suprascapular nerve, it descends below the omohoid, which comes out from the superior trunk, goes laterally, descends along the omohoid, goes more lateral, and then it goes onto the back below the trapezius and then crosses below the uh, transverse uh, scapular ligament at this point along with the artery and then innervates the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. It also gives uh, it also gives uh, 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 a branch or to the uh, cutaneous that's called as the uh, cutaneous branch of the suprascapular nerve and there are several articles you can go through that. The axillary nerve, it comes from the posterior cord uh, in the infraclavicular area. It goes more lateral and then it winds around after uh, crossing the uh, cordial lateral space below the teres minor. It, then it, 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 it innervates the joint. What I did not understand is that both these nerves, the suprascapital nerve, it comes from the front and then it goes behind and then it uh, innervates the joint. While the axillary nerve, it comes from behind and then it innervates the joint anteriorly. I don't know why they do that, but that's what they have been doing all these years. So the next part is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the posterior approach. Now in the posterior approach, uh, these are the patients all with frozen shoulders and uh, uh, these are the landmark guided. Now this is the uh, spine of the scapula, which is divided at midpoint, two centimeters. Um, uh, cephalad and lateral, that is a point for insertion of the uh, needle um, for the suprascapular block. This is the right shoulder, the patient is in prone position, that's the scapula. That's the tip of the scapula and the acromion, and this is a line which, uh, which, is, uh, which, which falls vertically down at the posterior fold of axilla. This is, the, um, this is the point where you insert the needle for the axillary nerve block. Once you hit the bone here, you will withdraw and in, in, inject around 10 uh, uh, ml of 0.25% uh, bupovacin along with Tramsalon that I use uh, 10 milligrams. And here what you can do is uh, you feel a pop and the pop is the, the needle goes through the teres, um, uh, minor uh, muscle into the collateral space and then you can inject 10 ml of 0.25% uh, bupovacin. Uh, when I inject uh, the contrast and took x-rays, you can see that this uh, lies in the suprascapular fossa and this lies in the axillary area. Uh, uh, where it blocks uh, both these nerves. I sometimes give, uh, give 20 ml. If I'm not satisfied with the uh, contrast spread, I give uh, 20 ml of suprascapular block. Now, this block has been used by uh, Price. Um, uh, probably he is no more, but he has popularized, popularized this block. He used in 40 patients, and he combined this block with 15 ml of 0.75% ropevacin at each point. And these were the patients for arthroscopic surgeries, and he found that 57% no morphine in vacuum. Now, 57% no morphine means 43%, uh, 57 means 43% required morphine in vacuum. So that's the other way of saying it. So almost, uh, almost equivalent number of patients uh, required morphine uh, in this group. 
Uh, this also you can keep, uh, keep the patient in the lateral position and the same anatomical landmarks. You can use the uh, peripheral nerve stimulator and you can inject 10 ml of these, uh, uh, these drugs. And you can also use this for, for the post operative uh, uh, shoulder surgeries. Uh, uh, maybe it may be closed or it may be open surgery. Now, the supraspinatus is the one which initiates the abduction. You can see that there is, uh, there is some abduction of the arm here. At this point, I give my local anesthetic. Uh, injection of 10 ml contrast again in this you can see the extensive spread and I found that uh, for the uh, chronic pain it, the suprascapular nerve is more than enough you don't have to give an axillary block but for post-operative pain uh, for, for the shoulder surgeries you really require a suprascapular nerve block with an axillary block and that is going to increase the efficacy of the block. So the outcome now they come they compared in uh, arthroscopic surgeries uh, this particular author in 2001 uh, when they compared the interscreen block, it was better than the combined block, which was better than the isolated block, uh, which was better than the intra-articular block. Now, when I joined uh, Sanjiti Hospital in the first year, I, I did a pilot study of 10 patients where I used 10 ml of suprascapular and 10 ml of axillary block for shoulder arthroscopy. But the vast demand more than four to five with multimodal analysis, which was in the form of diclofenac and the paracetamol. So, and the patient score was unsatisfactory. So, I did not uh, do this further because there's already evidence way, way back in 2001, 20 years back, that uh, the epsilon block is better than all these blocks. So, I did not uh, go ahead with this particular uh, study. With ultrasound, you can keep the probe either in the uh, transverse or the uh, longitudinal plane. You can identify the suprascapular nerve and the artery here. This is the ligament. The needle comes either in plane or out of plane, goes below this uh, ligament, and you can inject your local ana anesthetic there. Now, in pain clinic at in our hospital, uh, I do a lot of this uh, for the uh, uh, chronic pain uh, cases where I use the block for the uh, metastasis of this uh, scapula or frozen shoulders. A lot of frozen shoulder patients we get where we do this uh, particular technique where, where a surgery is not going to be useful. So this is the lateral position on the left side. The needle is brought uh, in plane from medial to lateral and then you can inject your um, uh, inject your local anesthetic along with uh, along with tramsalon so this is the artery uh, which you can see the suprascapular artery that's the needle which comes to the corner of the uh, uh, of the suprascapular nerve and then you inject your local anesthetic that's the drug which is going into the through the needle into the uh, uh, suprascapular close to the suprascapular nerve so the outcome when they use this for arthroscopic shoulder surgeries they found that when they use the uh, uh, this was a, a study of interscreen block versus the uh, combined block. In the first four hours, the interscreen was better than the combined block. The opioid consumption was more in uh, the combined block. Dyspnea and discomfort were more in interscreen block. And uh, this study by Newts, uh, they, they, the, the outcome or the results, they were, were equal or they concurred with the uh, study by Dhi from Toronto and uh, Pitombo from uh, Brazil. So, all these three studies, they mention the same thing, that the first four hours are better with interscreen block, and then it remains the same. The reason for inadequacy may be because the, there is an incomplete block of the suprascapular and the axillary. Uh, they reported 39 and 41% uh, inadequate blocks for this, and that is the reason why they failed more, while Newt's replied 19% uh, and 25% uh, inadequate block, and that's why they found that the outcome was better in their group. The other reason why is that the joint is supplied by the subscapularis nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, and the lateral pectoral nerve, and that's very important. And this comes all from the superior trunk or from the interscalene area as well. There is an anterior approach where the lateral pectoral nerve, we know that it innervates the superior surface and the suprascapular nerve innervates the posterior and superior. And in front of the joint, at the level of coracoid process, you can insert your needle, just uh, one pop and two pop, and then your through the pectoral is major and then you can inject your local anesthetic. Same way you go behind and you inject uh, behind the, uh, 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 the, the posterior edge of the clavicle, that's the anterior edge of the clavicle. Along this line, you can have these two blocks. And why these two blocks are required, it's very important. Now, this is a beautiful uh, cadaveric uh, sample which I obtained from uh, Coimbatore, uh, where um, Dr. Amuda, she is the head of department, she has dissected and displayed this. You can see the upper trunk, it gives the lateral pectoral nerve, it goes right into the shoulder joint. I have not seen this, uh, middle cord, the middle pectoral nerve also innervates the joint, the musculocutaneous nerve going in and the axillary nerve going in the inferior capsule. All these things, also the suprascapular nerve, which is not seen here, but it comes from the upper trunk. 
So if you consider this particular diagram, it does mean that you need to give all these blocks. All these nerves have to be blocked, and this can be blocked cannot be blocked at single point. This that's why it's called as the discrete nerve blocks. So with ultrasound, you can go for the uh, as I said that below the ovoid here, you can see the uh, suprascapular nerve going more laterally. This was found in 81 percent of the times, and it make it a point to see the suprascapular nerve all the time. For two reasons. There's one we are going to study below the infra omohoid. And the next is we go below the uh, uh, lateral, uh, lateral limit of the brachial plexus into the uh, corner pocket. And when they compare these three techniques, the suprascapular, anterior suprascapular, the supraclavicular, and the interscaline in a randomized controlled trial, what was found that the anterior suprascapular nerve block is equal to the interscaline block and is more efficient than the supraclavicular brachial plexus block. But the pulmonary function tests are best with the anterior uh, suprascapular nerve block. Can okay, yeah, somebody mute this? I think they are speaking a lot on this. So the next is the, the comparison of interscalene, supraclavicular, and anteroscapular. Here is the, uh, the, the picture which shows that they have similar, almost similar VAS course and similar opioid um, uh, requirements, but the incidence of uh, but the incidence of the, um, uh, the, uh, the phrenic nerve paralysis was least with the uh, anterior suprascapular uh, block. And this was more with the uh, interscalene block. So that is the uh, particular study. Coming to the systematic review and meta-analysis, which mentions these are the definitions. You can go through these definitions. 13 trials, 1,000 patients almost. The rest pain and morphine requirement were equal in these two blocks. But the adult effect was more with the interscalene block. And uh, what was the, um, you could see that uh, in the first few hours, almost up to six hours, the requirement of analysis has slowly increased uh, with the, um, uh, with the uh, endoscreen block, but it was uh, still higher up in the suprascapital nerve block. And then they both had the same uh, uh, amount of uh, analytic requirement in the uh, post-operative period. Now, coming to the cervical electrospinic plane block, this is a block which uh, I started in uh, our hospital. And uh, I use it now. There are a lot of articles that I publish and uh, with the electrospinic. There's one uh, which has come in the Saudi Journal that mentions the posterior electrospinic for the spine surgeries. And this is uh, the cervical electrode which I use for the, uh, uh, for the shoulder surgeries under general anesthesia. You can see that the patient is positioned. I introduce the needle from T2 to T1 in in-plane, and then once the needle is uh, at the uh, first costotransfer injection, I inject local anesthetic, and I follow that up to the cervical uh, area uh, from the thoracic, from the T1, and then I insert catheter uh, quite deep uh, inside the uh, uh, cervical electrospinal plane. You can see the analytic requirement intraoperative are less, the, and the hemodynamics are, uh, are uh, very well maintained. Uh, we published this in Turkey's journal, and uh, this has uh, led to a lot of arguments and re-arguments, and there are a lot of things now which is which is going on in the uh, in the uh, in the literature. Uh, you can see this is the uh, contrast going right up to the uh, cervical on the dorsal side and in the paravertebral space, but not going into the epidural space. Now, this was uh, this article was cited by um, by Ban Sui uh, in the Regional Anesthesia Pain Medicine. And they, 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 they mentioned um, that they read with a great interest this letter, but they also had uh, mentioned that this was just a case series and not a randomized controlled trial, and we agree. And shortly, we might do a pilot study or, con, uh, or consider doing a randomized controlled trial. Uh, this is an article. You can, uh, it has just come yesterday, and uh, this, was, this is, the, again, the cervical, regarding the cervical electrospinal pain block, a cadaver study, where we argue and oppose the... Um, the way the study was conducted by uh, these authors, because we have uh, some different ideas, and uh, we shortly we would like to publish our own uh, uh, study on the on, on the cadaver with the cervical electrospinal pain block. Now, Nitin and myself, we are studying uh, the block efficacy of 20.25 percent ropivacin with the standard uh, protocol, and we're trying to see the time to first analysis, the loss and total opioids, uh, which are our intermediate findings. And the, the, the early results with uh, three or four cases in pilot study are quite uh, encouraging, but you really require a catheter in place for continuous infusion. So this is a block which is away and quite uh, far away from the uh, brachial plexus. I have a word about the 
A word about the costoclavicular block and uh, which we can be used for shoulder analysis here. Um, this is still an argument which is going on regarding the costoclavicular block, which was described very well by Manoj Karmakar and um, Xavier Salah Blanche. And they mentioned that the drug which is deposited in below the clavicle in the costoclavicular area at the level of the posterior cord is the one which gives you a better analysis. The lateral cord is a bit uh, away. So I thought of inserting catheters in the costoclavicular area and then you go uh, uh, retrograde uh, towards the uh, supraclavicular area. And what I found was that when you insert the catheter which comes from the lateral and then when the bevel facing upwards, you use a stimulating catheter and try to keep on stimulating un until you go in the, uh, in the supraclavicular area. Uh, in one of the images, we could see the catheter tip lying here. That's the catheter tip which lies here between the androscalin and the midscalin muscle. And these are the roots which are stained, the C6 and the C7 roots which are stained. Uh, local anesthetic ejected with contrast at this point gives you a retrograde flow and not a cephalite, but a retrograde flow which comes back into the supraclavicular, the lateral part, and then in the infraclavicular, uh, or the costoclavicular and the infraclavicular. Uh, if you see this particular um, uh, uh, cadaveric dissection, you'll find that most of the drug it lies in this plane, in this plane, and it's going to block the whole of the uh, of, of the shoulder uh, joint. So probably this is a uh, costoclavicular block might be one of the future blocks, though it's a part of the brachial plexus. It's not uh, the interscalene or not the supraclavicular. So I consider it as away from the brachial plexus, but uh, but a part of the brachial plexus. Uh, Avinash and myself are studying uh, the contrast spread of 30 ml of 0.25% uh, ropivacin. And this is just a contrast spread and sensory delineation, not a voluntary study, but in patients who are undergoing the uh, upper limb surgeries. But we are just trying to assess this spread, whether it's going uh, cephalad and trying, trying to delineate the, uh, for the shoulder uh, analysis as well. So coming to the last part, the anal anesthesia and analysis tree uh, for shoulder surgery. For example, this is the shoulder surgery in uh, which we are performing. Uh, on the top will be interscalene block, high and low, which will can be used for anesthesia and analysis. That's A and A. The second would be a supraclavicular brachial plexus, sorus superior trunk block, again for A and A. The suprascapular nerve block and axillary block for analysis here. Then we have the infra and an in infraclavicular block. The pilot study which uh, we are conducting that might give you some good results. The costoclavicular block again for A and A. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether it, we can use it for anesthesia, but we, we, might, we might try some cases regarding this. Uh, the cervical epidural is uh, uh, it may not be uh, that popular uh, amongst the surgeons, but uh, it, it is quite popular among the anesthesiologists. I'm not sure how many of you still perform this particular block, but you can consider this as a part for shoulder. The cervical erectospinic pain block, we are studying a lot on this. We have reported uh, case series of five, as I mentioned earlier. We have done a cadaveric study. We are, we are trying to publish that. And we have done another cadaveric study. We are trying to publish that and we'll be doing a pilot study. So a lot of these studies will have together to uh, have a good um, uh, outcome uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the literature. So you have options. Uh, if you have options, you have problems to choose. So we would not have discussed all this if there were no alternatives at all. So 20 years back, endoscalene block was the only block that was used for the uh, for shoulder uh, anesthesia and analysis. But now you can see there are plenty of uh, blocks which have come into vogue and probably uh, they may not replace because endoscalene is gold standard. And we are trying to compare everything uh, against uh, the against the gold standard. So thank you very much for your